Good morning, class. How is everyone? Good, good. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Again, this is a, uh, this is not a topical study class. This is a line upon line. This is studying Scripture. This is a, uh, taking Scripture and expounding on it as it's written. We're, I'm not necessarily trying to give you something to apply <clears throat> to your life, even though it can be. What our goal is, is to give you a working understanding of the Bible, of the Scriptures, so that you and the Holy Spirit uh, have some understanding to, to the Scriptures and to the Bible. And believe it or not, even though the Bible covers thousands of years of the time that it was written, uh, it is in total, complete, and perfect order. And it's, and it's that order in which it's written that this type of teaching it gives testimony to, that, to teach that the order is perfect, it's in line. And if you look at it randomly, it's not in chronological order, it's not in a lot of different things. But when you understand how God lays out His Word and how God lays out His revelations, all of a sudden it's in perfect order. If any, I know a lot of people say, well, these are the lost books of the Bible, or this one should have been there and it was left. I get all that. <clears throat> but at the same time, I also understand I believe and trust God that He's given me His Word in the order, in the completeness that He wanted me to have it in the year uh, 2024. And that's called the Doctrine of Preservation. God has promised to you and future generations a copy of His Word. That's a promise from God. It's not a promise from mankind. And the reason it's here and the reason I have it is because God fulfills His promise of the preservation of His Word in the order as it's written, as how it's written, and He did it all on purpose. And so the goal of the, my type of teaching that I do on Sunday mornings is to give a testimony or a testament unto the written Word of God, the order that it's in, it's in perfect order. So I try to bring us an, uh, a level of understanding to see the perfect, uh, perfectness of His Word. And to do, to do this, we have to point out certain things. And it's not in chronological order, but I will bring some things in chronological order. So the reason chronological order it has some importance to it is because God, over the, the vastness of this book, uh, it covers 6,000 years actually, uh, uh, that the order is important because God didn't in chapter 1 of Genesis give all of His truth. He gave us this whole book over 6,000 years to dispense His truth unto the earth. And so it's in what we call God progressively reveals His truth. And at 71 years old, believe it or not, I know more now than I did when I was one year old. And that's because truth has progressively been poured into my life. And so now at the latter days of my life, believe it or not, against popular demand, I walk in more truth now than I had earlier in my life. And, uh, but so it is written with the Word of God that there's a more... Uh, completeness of the Word, and with not only completeness, but with understanding. Now, is God limited to His Word? Duh. No. I mean, God is fullness of His Word. Is God limited to His Word? The answer is no. That's the reason we are a people in this room, probably mostly, that believes that God still speaks today. And what you need to understand, that is probably not predominant in Christianity. Most people believe that God has spoken, which they take His Word. Say so He has spoken, and He doesn't speak beyond this book. Uh, in all honesty, I wouldn't have any problem with that if it just stuck to the book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What kind of, okay, just stick, okay, He doesn't speak, but that's okay. I mean, that's enough to go on. I mean, we don't need any more than that. But just but, but stick to it, you know. So we have basically in Christianity today, they say, no, God does not speak. He just does through His Word, and then they don't do His Word. So, and so the reason that we believe that God speaks today is because through His Holy Spirit He brings testimony unto His Word. And you'll have a hard time believing that this is His Word without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to confirm it that it's His Word. 
And what I mean by that is, as Christians, whether you believe it or not, <clears throat> we do have a yielding of the Spirit. We do, have a, we do say yes to God. We do have what we call obedience. We have these different exercises as Christians that we walk through and, and uh, that we live in in our Christian life. But don't think that you're doing that by your own power. That's a good place to say amen. You're not obedient to the Word of God by your own power. You're not that smart. You just, no, I'm sorry, you're just not that smart. The reason I believe it and I'm obedient unto it is because of the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. He gives me the measure of faith and the power to believe it. Can anybody have a witness of that truth? So, since it's the Holy Spirit that gives me the power to believe it, if I'm having some trouble with some areas of this book to believe, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm stretched. I mean, I know, okay, God says it, but I'm stretched to believe that it could be true. When I find that happens, it takes a measure of the Holy Ghost within me to give me the power to believe it. There again, I've said it before. I, when I got saved, I believe in a gospel. I, there's a man who lived 2,000 years ago, died across the waters that I've never been across in a country I've never been to. And because of the death, his sinless life, his death, burial, and resurrection uh, from the dead, if I believe in that story, I'll have eternal life. And there, I've said this before. That is ridiculous. In your common mind, you will not believe that. And if you're sitting here and you think you're so blame smart that you figured out that that's the truth, you're believing a lie. That's a ridiculous story. But you find yourself believing it. I know that offends our flesh. I know I've maybe even offended a few that would hear what I just said. But, it's, but, but you need to understand, you didn't pull it off. You said yes. We repented and said yes to God. And God says, I'll take it from here. I'm going to give you what you need to have to believe because that's not the only ridiculous message in this book. That's the reason I say that. It's full of ridiculous messages. And so I find myself in a dilemma, not with the lost world. I find myself in a dilemma with myself. I'm so challenged that I've got to believe all this ridiculous stuff of God. And then not only that, if I stand and proclaim it, I'm going to look like a complete idiot. To a rational mind. That's right. The people's going to say, well, Alan, you've lost it. You know, and, and I have to say, no, I found it. So we are in this dilemma of looking like complete idiots, or at least not being rational, not having an, uh, uh, an area of enlightenment. I'm not enlightened. Enlightenment means that man carries the light. And uh, so, so, but my point is this, this book is full of ridiculous stories. The only way you can jump this great divide and believe this holy book is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that God issues us the faith to believe it. Now, when I say that, when we get into Acts 2 and what we're doing now, that's what happens. There's an issue in of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. Peter's preaching a message challenging the nation Israel to believe a message. Now, when Peter challenges Israel to believe a message, you've got to understand, the Jews require signs to believe. You've heard me teach this before. There's a group of people, according to Jesus, is coming after that that does not require a sign, but yet they'll believe, he says. And that's us. We don't require. But the Jews at that time required signs. So Peter preaches a murder indictment at the end of Acts chapter 2, beginning of Acts chapter 3. He said, listen, I'm giving you all of this proof, and the proof is the signs and the wonders that Jesus did. And that's because those Jews required that. Now, I enjoy the signs and wonders. I like to see them. I'm all for it. But make no mistake about it, I have witnessed, I, when, when, I, when we say that we witness signs and wonders, you've got to understand the book of Acts is full of signs and wonders. 
to the nation Israel first. But it's full of signs and wonders, but it's covering 32 years. Right? So, here's my dilemma. We like to see signs and wonders, you know, at least 10 times a week or something or whatever. I'm not so sure we're not be pushing it a little bit. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just me talking out of my brain right now. I, I'm not so sure. But the good news is I don't require to, if I never see another one, I don't require it for the faith. Because I've already seen more than most, to be very honest with you. If, if, if I didn't see another one as long as I've lived, the truth is I've seen enough to be impressed. Does anybody else have that, have that witness? You know, So, but when we see Peter and the twelve, they require signs. So he's, in his messages and in his preaching, he throws up to them all of these miracles and everything. And, and then at the end he says, and, and come on, God raised him from the dead. That's the biggie. That's the biggie sign and wonder. He says, come on, God raised him from the dead. And not only that, Peter never preached, but what he didn't mention, the resurrection. Truth be, <laughs> truth is, Paul didn't either. He had a couple places I can say that, but he alluded to it strongly. But in none, nonetheless, the resurrection in that day was the biggie. Now today, uh, I'm afraid, we, I don't think we put the emphasis on the resurrection as it does in Acts 2 and in the, uh, in the, in the writings. The emphasis upon the resurrection is huge, and so as you're going through the book of Acts, you're going to see, talk about resurrection here, resurrection there. Resurrection's a big deal, so I want you as a Bible student to be able to say, there's the resurrection thing again. And as we see that, it makes us a little bit suspicious to what there might not be more to this resurrection than I'm getting at this point. This resurrection thing's kind of big, and I know it's big, but... I'm, I'm got a, I got a feeling I have yet to exhaust all the meaning of the resurrection because in this Bible and in the book of Acts, that was a big deal. So as we move forward this morning, uh, we're going to get into that part a little bit more. Uh, and I haven't even done my opening slide. Here we go, opening slide. As you can see, I'm excited about Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is lesson number uh, 19. This one's one by Charles Spurgeon. I kind of like this little one. On whatever subjects I may be called to preach, I feel it to be a duty which I dare not neglect to be continually going back to the doctrine of the cross. The fundamental truth of justification by faith, which is in Jesus Christ. This topic is essential to the life of the soul. And we find this in the book of Acts. And in the Christian church today, that's the reason I bring it up, Let's maybe start entertaining in our conscious mind, it's not our subconscious, but our conscious mind, that the cross is a big deal. And we want the cross of Christ to be fundamentally in all of our conversations. Uh, hopefully there's not a week goes by that we're, that's not in our conscious mind, the cross of Christ. And that's the reason uh, Spurgeon here, he is also saying the same thing. This topic is essential. Uh, to the life of the soul. So this that little last statement there speaks to me. There's some depth of understanding of the cross of Christ I have yet to, to discover. That's, that's my main point there. And that's what we're getting into here even in uh, the, books of Act, uh, the book of Acts here. Now as we finish up uh, chapter 2, then we start into chapter 3. Uh, you can look in your Bibles there if you would like. Uh, in Acts 2, this is the last part of 2, getting into uh, Acts 3. Uh, I'm going to read it here right quickly, 42 through 47, in Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Speaking of the early church here. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Wow. Many signs and wonders were still going on by the apostles. Many signs. Now remember, Peter's message of preaching wasn't necessarily to Gentiles, even though they heard it. Peter was preaching to the nation Israel. He was to, he was to start in Jerusalem, right? You know the commission, start in Jerusalem. 
He was to convince Jerusalem, they were to be persuaded and repent, that Jesus is the Messiah. Big deal. We know sitting here today that Israel and the Jews have yet to accept that message that Peter gave. So we find ourselves here in the exact same setting as it was in Acts chapter 2. I say again, the exact same setting. And the Jews today have not received Jesus as the Messiah. Peter was offering it here. It's still being offered. And they've still to accept it. And they're still rejecting it. Paul comes on in Romans, gives us a little more information, which we'll get into, that they're blinded. That they blind, and they, and Paul says they have been blinded in part that the fullness of the Gentiles might come in. So we're these that don't have to see signs and wonders to believe. We're called a time of the Gentiles, and we're coming in. But there'll be a time that our coming in is a fullness. But Jesus is speaking about a group that's not prophesied about. The time of the Gentiles is not an Old Testament prophecy. It's called an interim. It's called, I've taught you about parentheses. A parenthetical message is something that's just, all of a sudden it's a secret. Paul says it in Ephesians 3. It's a secret. It's a mystery. That these, it's going to be a time of the Gentiles stuck in here. So we are testament. We're a testament that we are those people. But I want to see you to see where we do this. And he goes on to verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread and house to house did eat their meat with gladness, singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So that's the verses that we're going into right now. So it says there that they sold all that they had. And the question is, well, why are we not doing that? Well, I've heard it preached. Well, you just need to have the attitude that you would if you could. Or you would if the Lord asked you to sell all. Well, nah, that's not what was going on here. Everybody sold all they had and came together, just like the group down at Hiddenite. A lot of people like to throw rocks at it. It's called 12 tribes. I knew the owner, or not the owner, I knew the, the patriarch that started that, 12 tribes. He's dead now, been dead for two years. In which they got 40 or 50 of those Christian communes all over the world. And I knew, I knew of him and some of them, and, and they treated me like an uh, uh, a, uh, accepted Gentile. <laughs> Uh, they consider themselves as the 12 tribes. And they, but they did. They believed those verses. They, you sell everything you got and you come together and uh, join 12 tribes in Hidden Night and you're, it's what you call communal living. And actually they're doing, I think, doing a very good job. But I was in there one night and, and uh, Gene Spriggs was his uh, English name. He had a Hebrew name. I don't remember. It was Adabi Hubi or something. I don't remember. What it was. And, and Gene was in there and it, they were having a conference and and there was a lot of young people at that conference, you know, and I went into the deli and, and Gene said, Alan, come over here a minute. And I said, okay. So I went over there. He said, in front of all of these witnesses, he said, I want you to tell them why you won't join us. And uh, he always, we picked on each other a lot. And uh, I always told him he just wanted a dairy farm. I, that's what <laughs> I said, I know what you're after, Gene. You just want a dairy farm. But anyway, we'd pick back and forth. He said, I want you to give a testimony to all these young people why you won't join us. I said, okay. So I stood up in the middle. Right there in the front doors of the deli, he had them all standing around. And there was about, uh, I don't know, half a dozen or eight or ten old gray-haired men there too. But it was basically young adults. But there was some, you know how it is at the deli. They all got their little ponytails and and um, I said, well, Gene, look around the room here. I said, see all these gray-headed old men? He said, I do. I said, I don't think you can afford any many. You're getting gray-headed top-heavy. I said, I don't think you can afford me. And he said, that's not a good enough excuse. I said, it'll have to do for now. <laughs> and so, but anyway, and I told him, I said, Gene, I said, when Jesus is sitting in Jerusalem on the throne, I will sell everything I got and go to Jerusalem. 
I said, you're not in Jerusalem yet. I said, you've sold everything you got, but you're, Jesus ain't there yet. I think you're a little early. That's what, I, that's what I would tell him. Because the truth is, we're in this interim time, and they don't have that understanding. Now, do I think it's bad of what they're doing? I personally do not think it's bad. I mean, it's working well. And it's amazing how God will still honor even if we don't divide the, the Word of God just exactly right. If we handle it even incorrectly a lot of times, He exhorts us, and I want to know the truth of the Word of God. But the Word of God is something that we can even mess up real bad, and God still looks after us. He still he's honors, <clears throat> He honors their heart. Heart's pure. They're trying to do it with the book. And it's working for them. I'm fine with it. And, uh, but I'm not going to give you my farm. I, I mean, <laughs> so anyway, uh, but my point is this. They sold everything they had. I'll sell everything I got and go to Jerusalem. When, you see, Peter was preaching, you'll repent. We're going to, see, they were looking for Israel to repent. And Peter says, if you repent, we'll get on down into it. If you'll repent, God, he's going to send Jesus right back. So they sold everything they had. They were coming together, waiting for Israel to be converted because they knew that Jesus might be here in two weeks. And he's going to rule and reign, and we're going to rule and reign with him from Jerusalem. That was, that was why they did that. I want you to see that. That's why they did it. Not only that, and I can't go into it now, but not only that, that crowd's not going to die. They're going to skip everything. They're going right into the millennial reign of Christ. You got that? So they were looking to walk into the millennial reign. I think it's important that we understand what we're reading when we see it. There's a reason I don't sell everything I got and move in with them down here tonight. And it's because I know that's not where we are. I know that's where they were. And I know that's where they'll be again. But the next thing the Jewish nation will do is the Jewish nation will turn on the Gentiles. We'll be their enemy. Now, right now, we're their friend, and I'm going to stay their friend. But the white horse in Revelation, the first one, the one that's the Antichrist, the Jewish nation will build the platform for the Antichrist. That's how bad they reject Jesus as their Messiah. Are you with me? It's pretty bad. Not only did they reject Jesus, they set up the platform for the Antichrist, and it'll probably be a Muslim that does uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. That's probably what it'll be. Now, let's move on. That's just a little introduction to where we're headed. But I want you to see why they did that and said that. At this point, Israel had not been set aside. Israel is set aside in Acts 28, 28. <clears throat> well, we got another 28 years to go. And then in Acts 28, 28, it's, how do we know that Israel rejected the, the gospel? And I'm going to get into that. It's because they had all the disciples killed. They basically all but one. They were, they shut down, their goal was to shut down the gospel. That's a pretty good rejection, don't you think? When the 12 disciples were martyred, so to speak, all but one perhaps. Some things that they all were. But nonetheless, that's the great rejection, is they killed all of the messengers we're speaking about now. Uh, Israel killed them all, basically. And so, there, or Jews did. So, therefore, uh, that's when you say, okay, the message that's offered to Israel has been fully rejected. Now, all right, so we get up here to the first church, and I just read it, and they continue steadfastly. It's Apostles' Doctrine Fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them uh, to all men as every man had need. Now, it says holding everything in common was not socialism or communism because it was voluntary. You see that? I've had people over and over say, well, Alan, that's just communism. Well, no, it's not. 
this was done by the Spirit. They were led by the Spirit. Um, it says they had all things in common. It didn't say that they divided up everything equally. Because they didn't. It was given to you as you had need. Done by the Holy Ghost again. But this is not having, it's not socialism. A lot of people say, I've heard them say that. Well, we, that's for socialism in Acts 2. I'm like, well, you just, uh, yeah, let's cut the chase. You're an idiot. That's not what it's saying. That is not what it's saying. Uh, their goods were not evenly distributed, but were given according to meet uh, their needs, it says. They were in fellowship one with another. So you can see, if you, how could it truly be centered upon Christ? How could it truly be non-selfish if your expectation was it had to be divided up equally? Right? So you get the, the gist of... Uh, so the Spirit of Christ means, and when we come to church, anytime we get into this equality thing that's pushed in our society today, you've totally fallen off the truck as far as the movement of the Spirit. Because we're here to help each other. Uh, if you're requiring equality, well, that's not, well, if they get to do this, why don't we get to do that? And I'm like, if we got to go back to that Christianity 101, I don't know if you're saved. Right? We all get that. Okay. So that's the reason even with today's wokeness and all of that, all this mess on equality and all that, I'm like, that is so against who we are as Christians. It's not that we just don't agree with that. That's against everything we live for and everything we stand for. <clears throat> now, it says they continue daily in Acts 2.46, and they continue daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread house to house, did eat their meat and with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, as such should be saved. So here we have the outpouring of the Spirit, but even the next day we see they're meeting in the temple again. So you're like, well, that's odd. Why, why are they in the upper room at outpouring the Spirit now the next day in the temple? They're there to show up in the temple again. Well, there's a reason for that. Their Christian faith was a day uh, to day reality. They met daily, we see. <clears throat> we do. We do good to get once a week, right? But anyway, they met daily uh, as a group. Uh, they won souls daily, it says. And so if that's the case in 247, if they won souls daily, I'm trying to think, did I win one last year? Right? Did I win one? In other words, I want to argue his Bible. I want to argue Scripture. And I got the way I believe. And I want to stand around and argue it and yada, yada, yada. But, how many, but have you led anybody to Christ in the last year? five years and you want to argue Bible I know where does it say you got to win somebody to Christ to argue Bible but to me it just seems a little ridiculous I would love to sell you a dairy farm and uh, so it says here that the Lord added to the church daily now there's something here you got to understand who added to the church daily so it's an addition of the Lord. So when souls were born again, it means that we're joining the Lord for salvation. It's not that I just get on a street corner and start preaching. But it's, am I daily following that? So it gives me this uh, the little bit of the general rule that's in my brain that continually haunts, haunts me. That an average day in a Christian would be that I'm walking with the Lord. Just uh, an average day should be that I win at least one soul a day. Or, or at least we as a, as a body. That means we would have, uh, just as a body we could do it. So that means we'd ha have at least four or five saved a month, right? I mean, that's not asking too much according to this example. If we're walking with the Holy Ghost, because I think it's a heart of the Spirit, and we have it, it doesn't say it's a law or a rule. I just know it's possible. It's just possible. And it, it appears to me that when your hearts are in tune with each other and you're looking after each other daily and we're walking in the Spirit daily, it just seems like a natural outpouring. Out, uh, uh, the average harvest of that should, uh, should be a one a day average by at least the community. And if that be the case, we'd have 30 a month added to the church. It's just something... That, I have what I call my aggravating scripture. That's one of them. Now, 
It says they, they increased in the number daily. Here it is again. Now, we all want the outpouring of the Spirit and speaking in tongues and everything, but we don't, well, we, we don't talk much about this, you see. So, you can say, well, you've got a, you're filled with the Spirit because you're speaking in tongues. And I'm saying, well, if you're filled in the Spirit, you're going to lead somebody to Christ every day. That, I mean, that's an example, right? But so you can see how in our minds we tend to, to focus on, on uh, certain, certain things. And if I was going to break down this verse and say, what is the main purpose of this verse? To me, it would be salvation of souls. You can uh, come up with your own ideas also. Uh, here it says, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased uh, in numbers daily. And that's further in the book. In Acts, 10, uh, Acts chapter 16, we're talking another eight or ten years later, they're still adding daily. I'm like, come on, God, didn't they, didn't they backslide a little bit somewhere? <laughs> now, the answer is they did. But even here, they're still winning. And, and I don't think that's a cliche. I don't think the Scripture's just throwing it out there as a general idea. I think it's throwing it out there for us to read and say, okay, here's what can be accomplished if the church is walking together in unity and, and we're really, really kicking, you know, running on, off all eight cylinders. So, now that moves us into Acts chapter 3. We have left Acts 2. We've been there for uh, a century now, but we're moving on. So, <laughs> we'll move into Acts chapter 3. Uh, now, this is the first apostolic miracle. Now, this is a really an interesting miracle. Uh, recorded that we know. This is the first apostolic miracle post uh, Acts chapter 2. And it's the lame man's healed. So let's, there again, um, what we're looking for is to look into the Scripture, understand the Scripture, why is it written there, and why did the Holy Ghost put this in the storyline here in Acts chapter 3. So the first apostolic miracle, it's in Acts 3.1. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple, uh, the hour of prey being uh, the ninth hour. There again you can see that they went up together where? They, they, went, they went back to the temple. What, you just had this big outpouring. And now the next day you're going back up to the temple. It's Peter and John. Now as you get into the book of Acts you see Peter and John uh, written about a lot. Here we start uh, noticing the pairing up of Peter and John is, is what we start noticing and seeing uh, here. Now, verse 2, And a certain lame man uh, from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now an alms, you know, is an offering or giving something uh, she carried him up there, laid him down so that people would give, it said, alms there at the temple. It says that they laid daily, that she laid him daily uh, at the temple. He was there to beg for alms. And so alms is something such as money or food given freely to relieve uh, the poor, distributing alms to the needy. So there we have charity. So this is, so he were, they were going there, being laid there on purpose to receive this uh, charity. Now this is interesting, and I say all that for a, actually for a reason. In verse 3 and 4 it says, Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, uh, asked an alm. So here's Peter and John, they walk up to the temple, and then they ask for, uh, for some charity there. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. So here they walk up there asking for alms. He, he said, no, he said, look at us. Look at, look, look at us. Here's the famous uh, verses next. Now, this is amazing after all that had happened at the upper room. The day before, Peter and John still went up to the temple uh, to pray. So we can see that this, and the reason is the message is still being offered to the nation Israel. The man is not asking for healing, he's asking for alms. Now that's, that's, so, here's what I want this verse to challenge us up with. And that is, do you have enough faith for healing? Well, here we find the lame man, he wasn't even asking for it. So just put that in your little notebook. There's a thought, just a thought. <clears throat> and he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something. 
of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Does praise God right there. Wouldn't you? Wow. I mean, come on. He wasn't even looking for that. But the anointing and the call of the Spirit was so strong that G, he was asking for a, an offering. Their direct orders from heaven was to bring healing. So don't think that everybody has to have faith for healing. That's not what's going on. Do you see that? What's going on here, do we have faith to bring healing to the situation? Amen. So I submit to you, who has a greater gift of healing than healing? It's the one that's bringing the word of healing. We like to blame the person. They need to have more faith. It's not the way it works. You're to have faith to bring healing into the moment if the Holy Spirit is called for it. Because here we have no record that he was asking just for food, money, uh, anything like that. So can you pray for somebody that's not asking for it? The answer is, I've got a biblical example how you can. And the answer would be yes. If you don't like that example, take it up with God. I'll just give you a biblical example how we can pray for the sick even if they're not asking for it. Now, to me, I have a witness inside of me. That sounds just like Jesus to me. Huh? That sounds just like... The truth is, you know what? When I got saved, I wasn't really asking for it. When I got to the moment, I knew I needed it. But I wasn't running after it at the moment I ran into it. But somebody offered me salvation when they gave me the message and I wasn't really seeking it at that time. But when it was offered to me, I knew it was the truth. I just knew it. I was convicted. I didn't contribute anything to my conviction is my point. Now, that seems like a fine line, but as a prophetic people, you got to see that fine line. We are the, the ambassadors of the kingdom. We're going to give people stuff that they don't have enough sense that they even need. We, we are the offense. If you're playing defense, you're on the wrong side. We're offense. That's the reason I'm not in for defending the gospel too much. I'm more into doing the gospel. If we can see this. So keep in mind the supernaturalness of this book. The supernaturalness of this book is about us hearing the Holy Ghost and by us being commissioned in that moment to bring healing. Now, I wanted to step to here. Peter was operating in a prophetic moment. This is the prophets. This is the prophecy. Listen to me. This is prophecy. Peter was operating in prophecy here. He said, go on several. I don't have. That's material stuff. But such as I have, I give thee. Prophecy in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That healing moment was a word of prophecy unto the lame man. How many see that? That was a word of prophecy unto the lame man. Now, the lame man had to respond to it. He didn't have to stand up and walk. But he responded to it as truth. Now, the question is, would he have walked had he not believed in it? And my answer is, I don't know. But I do know this. That word of prophecy brought a lot. I want you to see that a word of prophecy can be a word of healing. Amen. And not only that, it usually is to one degree or another. Are you with me on that? Do you see that? 
And there's power when it, if you're, if you're trying to lead somebody in healing and you're trying to get them into enough uh, faith for healing, and I'm not going to dare say God doesn't heal that way because God can do anything He wants to. But this example we have right here in Scripture is that you can give a prophetic word in faith by the Holy Spirit and somebody who's not even asking for healing can get healed. And that's all i got to say about that. It's just what the Word of God says. Let's move on. He said, Silver and gold have I none. Such as I have, I'll give unto you. Now, here's the key. Alan Smith, silver and gold have I none. Uh, I would really think, have you ever seen people that you didn't have what they needed? It could be cancer. It could be anything. You know without a shadow of a doubt that you cannot within you, the silver and gold within you, you cannot produce what's needed to heal that person. So the first thing in understanding a prophetic word is that you're not the one that's producing it. The word's bigger than you. You're offering more than you got. Amen. You see how ridiculous this thing gets? You're offering more than you got. But it's because we offer more than we got and the Holy Ghost told us to offer it that the miracle can take place. But you've got to see that. You've got to see what's developing here. And it's not done through reasoning. It's done through a relationship. Peter, John, and the like were walking in such a relationship with the Holy Spirit at that time that they brought a prophetic word to a man to be healed and he wasn't even asking for it, and he got up and walked. Now, to me, that's just a wow moment, right? A wow, wow moment. Now, you got to understand, do I think that can operate in the church today? The answer is a big, fat yes. This is big and fat as I can say it, yes. Yes. So, I'm not got a long lip that it's not happening, because I got a feeling some of that's happened a little anyway, and I don't know it. But the point being, this the church had already been birthed and was moving. And matter of fact, matter of fact, I watched a thing on A. A. Allen. I don't know. I watch a lot of these old preachers and healing evangelists and and stuff like that. And A. A. Allen, he was kind of out there. I mean, you talking about a stretch? He would stretch you, but. Hey, Alan, I heard him speaking there one day, and he reminded me of this verse. And they, they said, how do you, how do you, why do you have so many healings in your tent meetings? He said, oh, it's easy. He said, I, I look through the crowd, and I find the sickest person in there. He said, that's where I start. He said, the rest of it's easy. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm like, he said, and he said, so you don't start little and build up. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Start with the tough one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. And, I, and so when I came to the scripture and the lame man, he, and I started, I'm like, well, here it is. Here's A.A. Allen. That's his example. He just, lame man, not even asking for healing. Can you see? What an element of relationship that you can have with the Holy Ghost. I can have that. You can have that. Do I think A.A. Allen did everything perfect? Not on your life. I think he ended up kind of an alcoholic or something. Didn't he end up an alcoholic? And then, I, of course, you know how it goes. Everybody says, well, everything he did... Wasn't of God, because he was an alcoholic there in the end. I mean, tell that guy on the stretcher that. I don't know. Point being, it's not because of Peter and John. It's not because A.A. A. Allen. It said he, for whatever reason, and God chooses it, A.A. A. Allen had the faith to pick the worst one first, because he said God had shown him, if you start with the hard one, everything else is just a nice piece of cake, he said. 
Here we said we will have revival. And he said, if I start with the hard one first, people just start getting healed and we don't say anything. And I'm like, I'm like, wow. That just, that, that just so is, is, is amazing to me. And not only that, and I went on to look at it, A.A. Allen had a piece of property out in New Mexico or somewhere, and they had this big place they built called Miracle City. And people would go there and all that. But ultimately, it's just a deserted tabernacle and housing. And, and, uh, and, I, and I've noticed something. Where there is a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Seems like it has a beginning and an end for some reason. And usually God does not allow there to be a monument left. <clears throat> when there's a true move of God, the only thing, the only thing that remains is what God did in the hearts of people. Amen. That's what remains. So when we get together, it's important not one individual's uplift. Boy, ain't they got it? No, come on, y'all. What we're after is what God does in the hearts of His people, because we know that's the only thing that remains. We're not trying to build a big tabernacle. We're not trying to build a big church. What we're after is what remains, and that is to be something that's real, totally real. Now. Do I think that I can cause a lame man to rise up and walk that's not even asking for it? I'm not there yet, but mark her down. That's where I'm headed. That is where I'm headed, is to have that relationship with the Holy Ghost. Then when the Holy Spirit says, do it, I know that the faith, the power is there to produce it. Are you with me? So let's move on quickly. I got four minutes and I'm going to use them here. He did that. And I'll notice this one too. And uh, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I noticed in A.A. A. Allen that he used that phrase a lot. It's in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Ah, yeah, yeah. And when I read it and I come, I'm like, he, he's... I bet he's taking this thing literal. Now, it might not make any difference, but this bird's going to start using Jesus Christ of Nazareth when I pray for the sick. Say, well, Alan, that's kind of like a formula. And I don't care if it's a formula or what. But, but I just noticed in watching that, and of course, I'd already prepared for this a couple of weeks ago, but I noticed in watching that, he'd say, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm like, so I just started connecting the dots a little bit, and I thought, well, yeah, I don't know if that's a magic recipe or not, but it's still good Bible, right? It's still, it's still good Bible. All right, and then he went on to say in this next verses here, 7 and 8, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, uh, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Wow. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the temple, them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. Amen. Now, I told you <laughs> that this book was full of ridiculous stories. I've already told you that. There's one. There's another one. It takes faith to believe it. God's got to issue us something that we really believe that. We've got to go from that's a nice little Bible story to that's reality of today's church. That's right. It's not just a little, it's not no, it's not getting swallowed by a fish. This is not just a little Bible story. It's real stuff. So he's jumping, leaping, praising God. I, listen, I'm not even raised from being lame and jumping and leaping and praising God. <laughs> I got a good ways to go. I mean, right now I'm just enjoying y'all when you do it. And I'm using as an excuse I'm a 71-year-old man. <laughs> I don't need to give y'all any personal confessions. I'm going to quit. Now, 
So it says that his feet, his ankle bones received strength. It, it actually, it says that he had new sockets and joints created. When you go back into the Hebrew, it's, talk, it's different words there. I mean, in Greek. So, and it says he, he leaping up, stood. Now, do you get that? He didn't stand. He leaped up. That's, he was excited. He was excited. How far away am I from excitement coming into this meeting today? I kind of drag and sashay in and, and think, well, I hope Trevor don't talk too long today. I hope he can at least hold my interest. I hope the worship is just a couple songs, not too many. Let's get through today so I can get on home and eat. This dude, he leaped. He was full of excitement because he ran into the spirit of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. He was aware of it. Here's the point. You can be in the presence of a lot more than you're aware of. Did you know that already in this group of people right here, I ever want, people in this sanctuary right now, springtime, you've already walked in the presence of a lot more snakes than you know. I'm sure that's a refreshing thought. <laughs> and my point is, you can walk in the presence of something and not know it's there. According to this book, we're coming together this morning, and God says where two or three is gathered together, I'm there in, in the midst of you. Well, there needs to be just a little, little bit of leaping here and there, don't you think? I mean, I mean, if we really believe that, I'm making a confession. We don't really believe that. Or there'll be a little leap in it somewhere. Now, I've got more to go with that, but I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> I'd love for you to be back here next week and let us finish it. So, Lord Jesus, we love you. And, Lord, I do pray. I pray for a leaping spirit. I'm all right with that. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we could have a little bit of excitement, not manufactured, but because we are, con we are consciously aware of your presence. So, Lord, I do ask and pray that the consciousness that you're in the room, the consciousness that you're here, I pray, O oh God, like Peter and John, that they healed a man and he didn't even ask for it. Amen. I pray, O oh God, that the faith would be issued to this congregation. I pray, O oh God, that you'd give us a leaping faith. And what I mean by that, Lord, is a leaping faith is that we're conscious and aware of your presence in the room and the ability that you have to change the circumstances of lives that are in this room, in this county, and even in the world. Make us conscious, I beg you, Lord, for a consciousness of Peter and John to be able to say, rise up and walk, and you didn't even ask for it. I'm asking for the leaping spirit to come upon us, even though there's some in here not asking for it, and I pray that they'll embarrass themselves. <laughs> Y'all better get me out of here. So, Lord Jesus, we love you. We do ask and pray, Lord, to make us aware of your presence. We pray, oh God, that you'll notice it in our worship, and you'll receive our worship. We'll receive you. And we ask you to be God and let us be your people. And the house said, amen and amen.